Welcome everyone to our second installment of our leadership series. We are super excited to be here today with a special guest speaker. But first, I would like to thank the Garland High School Band for that amazing performance. I would also like to thank the Garland High School for hosting this event. Thank you so much for your generosity. We are very excited. We are very excited to introduce our guest speaker, General Charles Brown Jr. Please help us welcome General Charles Brown. Thank you so much for being here. I know it means a lot to the students for you to take time out of your busy schedule. Thank you so much. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce our senior representative panel. I'm McLean Marshall, representing Stellar Keller Saginaw High School. I'm Taya Escudero, representing the Katie West Park campus. I am Tasia Foster, representing Arlington Grand Prairie High School and House of Charisma. <laughs> <laughs> I am Enoch Adoye, representing Garland High School. All right, before we get started into the questions, I want to take a minute to read some bit of biographical information about our guest speaker. General Charles Q. Brown Jr. is the commander of the Pacific Air Force's Air Component Commander for U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and Executive Director of the Pacific Air Combat Operations Staff, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickman in Hawaii. The Pacific Air Forces is responsible for Air Force activities spread over half of the globe in a command that's more than 46,000 airmen, serving principally in Japan, Korea, Hawaii, Alaska, and Guam. General Brown was commissioned in 1984 as a distinguished graduate of the ROTC program at Texas Tech University. He has served in a variety of positions in the squadron and wing level, including an assignment to the U.S. Air Force Weapons School as an F-16 instructor. General Brown has a commanded a fighter squadron, the U.S. Air Force Weapons School, two fighter wings, and a U.S. Air Force's Central Command. Prior to his current assignment, he served as a deputy commander of the U.S. Central Command. And you have also um, flown more than 2,900 hours including 130 combat hours. That's a lot of responsibility in flying, General. It is. <laughs> so I was doing the math, and, you know, 2,900 flying hours, that's over around 121 days of straight flying. You know, we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, um, as she said, over 2,000 hours, that's a lot of passion and a lot of commitment. So did you grow up with the passion for flying, or was there a situation which led you to love flying? Uh, there was a situation. So um, when I uh, graduated from high school, or graduating from high school, my, my father's retired army. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, quote, four years in the military will not kill you. <laughs> and so uh, my, uh, my intent was uh, originally to, uh, I did ROTC at mm -hmm. Texas Tech, and I almost quit after the first uh, semester. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I got a ride in an airplane when I went to summer camp. and. Uh, I was going to be an engineer and be four years to get out. Then once I got that ride, I decided I wanted to become a pilot. And then from there, um, I just said the rest is kind of history. If I may, General, why did you almost quit after the first year? Um, they wanted me to do a lot of things I wasn't really interested in doing. Um, I wanted to, uh, I was playing numeral sports with the, uh, uh, the guys in my dorm. ROTC wanted me really to participate in uh, a bit more and to uh, all the events they wanted to do. And uh, my dad had taught at ROTC after his second tour in Vietnam. And uh, based on that, he told me all I had to do was go to class and go to lab. That was the only requirement. So I did class, lab, and I was on the drill team. And, uh, and after going to summer camp, then I really started having a good time. What, um, sorry, but what do you believe to be your most memorable, memorable experience flying? Hmm. There's a few. <laughs> uh, I've ejected. Oh. Uh, ejected from an F-16. Uh, I spent about 15 minutes in Everglades. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, so that was, that was pretty memorable. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, I was flying F-16. I was stationed in Homestead uh, Air Force Base in, uh, just outside of Miami. And uh, I was coming back and my aircraft and my wingman's aircraft got struck by lightning. Uh, and then uh, I had a centerline gas tank. The gas tank uh, exploded, caught a hydraulic line and caused a uh, fire in the engine. And uh, so I flew it for about five minutes. And, uh, and when my wingman said, you have a lot of fire back there now. And our checklist says if fire persists, eject. And so I just followed the checklist and pulled the handle and uh, out in the Everglades and got picked up by a Coast Guard helicopter about 15 minutes later. Was your heart racing during that? I would have been so terrified. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, this is part of a, um, you have all the training. And so going through the steps was pretty easy. It was the, uh, I was probably in the parachute for about five minutes. So there's probably a couple minutes after I'd done all the things I needed to do uh, that I thought, I hope there's nothing down there. That <laughs> and uh, fortunately it was not. General, after such a eventful experience, what made you want to get back into the plane? Were you afraid? Uh, not really. I flew, uh, I was, took about a week off as I did a little bit of the uh, investigation. And then uh, the next week I flew about seven times. <laughs> Um, and it was just a matter of uh, getting back in and uh, building confidence in the, in the airplane. How do you build that confidence? How do you have, like, how do you trust in yourself to do that again? Well, it's all training. I mean, and you, you just, it's all repetitive and it becomes almost a second nature at, uh, when you go fly the airplane. So even just flying the airplane becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, second nature in the aspect of uh, being able to operate the airplane and just uh, become almost one with the airplane. And well, so, I would expect that after so many hours in the general. Yeah. Um, general, I have a question I'd like to ask you. Um, what's more important to you, your core values, your vision, or your mission, you know, like as a person? And also, how do you keep that your priority? Um, values. Mm. Um, your values are probably the most, that builds your character, and it's your reputation that precedes you. And I think the key part of, uh, of any leadership uh, opportunity uh, it's folks will look at how you carry yourself. It's the decisions you make, the actions you take. And so how you, you maintain those core values is important. And uh, there'll be times where things don't go so well. And if you have those core values, uh, folks will look past the fact that you, uh, as I say, have an offshots moment and you're able now to uh, bounce back and, and, uh, and, and hold true to those core values. That helps to drive your vision, drive your, your mission um, as you go forward. Absolutely. Do you mind sharing some of your core values to everyone listening? Well, um, the way I look at, uh, I've got four leadership tenets um, that I, I will tell you that like, they came to me uh, uh, when I was probably a senior in high school. I did a radio interview, mm. uh, executed a high standard, be disciplined in execution, pay attention to detail, and have fun. Execute at a high standard. Personally, professionally, I do not play for second place. <laughs> uh, if I'm in, I'm in to win. But I also know I'm not God's gift to everything I do. There'll be times in it, uh, but it won't be due to lack of trying. So I'm always putting my best foot forward. I'm very disciplined about how I do things. Um, you know, once I've committed myself to doing things, that's what I tend to do. Um, attention to detail, uh, I ask a lot of questions um, and really pay attention to how I execute things. And I ask those questions also so I can learn because I'm not the expert in everything. And the more I ask questions, the more I learn. Uh, my goal is every day uh, when I leave my office, I'm gonna be a little bit smarter than when I walk in. And then I want to have fun. And uh, you, you got to enjoy what you do. And if you don't enjoy what you do, then you probably need to pick another career path. Um, and it's not about the money, because uh, I, you know, I could probably make a lot of money flying for the airlines, but I have never had a desire to fly for the airlines. Uh, I enjoy working with people. I enjoy leading. And, uh, and it's also part of my family. You know, so my family has a boat as well. I have a wife and two sons. And, uh, and so they've, uh, they have a boat on this. And if we're not all having fun together, then it's, uh, we, I probably wouldn't pick another career path was a little earlier. That's very good, General. Like, you bring up your family the last time. Um, what advice would you give to all of us listening and watching to how to maintain our own personal morals and values going forward in our lives? Well, the uh, one of the things when I talk about leadership, and I have a few th thoughts on leadership, and uh, one of the things that I look at is uh, in order, before you can lead others, you got to be able to lead yourself. Okay. And so I think about it in several aspects of that is, uh, you know, once you're in a leader position, leadership position, you need to kind of be who you are, maintain your core values. Uh, you need to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, I like to say that uh, on a scale of a 
one to 10. Um, if you're a two, you'll never be a 10. And so what you really want to do is focus on the areas that you're really strong at. Uh, I also like to quote that 50% of the world is below average. That, that is a fact. And 50% uh, of the folks here today are below average. But the question is below average at what? Mm. You need to figure out what parts you're really good at and focus on those and make those really strong. The other areas, then I would actually say, uh, have a friend who has some of those other skill sets that you would actually uh, call upon. I like that answer, Juno. Um, since you mentioned um, in the being a leader yourself, since you've been to Italy, I believe, South Korea, all over the world, I would consider you to be an international leader. Um, so for us, we are learning Spanish, Chinese, and English. How do you think that will help us in the international community going forward into our teachers? What it does, it gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I've found. Uh, you know, I, have, I have had been able to live overseas, lived in Germany, lived in Italy, lived in Qatar, um, lived all across the United States. Um, just in the past year, I've traveled to 12 different countries um, in the Pacific. And uh, I went to Antarctica and the South Pole um, just this past year. So I've been to every continent. The key part about your, the studies you do here is it gives you a different perspective about world events. And uh, each part of the world has a different perspective. And the better you understand that perspective, um, the better you're able to engage in the international world. I think the one thing I've found is that uh, every country has a little bit different uh, look and view on things. And uh, the more you broaden your perspective, uh, the more effective you'll be. And it's really interesting you say that because we are all here trained to be international leaders. Also, I wanted to ask you something because you are in charge of that Pacific region, and that's a very specific region. So I was going to ask you, since you have so much expertise in that area, what is something that keeps you up at night or has been challenging about managing the Air Forces in that region? Well, one thing, it's big. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about a, being a you know, native Texan, you, uh, everything's bigger. Uh, it's even bigger out in the Pacific. Um, when you look at the size, it's about 9,000 miles from east to west. We, we talk about it. It's, uh, you can go all the way from Hollywood to Bollywood. Um, is the distance. It's about 12 different time zones. The, the challenge I look at is the, uh, the, the dynamics of the size of the region and uh, what it will take in order to uh, maintain a level of security. When, when you look at the size of the region, and of course, 60% of the world's population lives in the, Indo in the Indo-Pacific, 44% of the world's trade. And so when you look at how important that region is, those are the kinds of things I pay attention to to ensure we are working with our partner nations in the region to maintain a level of security and stability. It's really good to be able to work with other nations and to understand their perspectives and their views so that way you can ensure uh, diplomacy because it's very important also to make sure that we're maintaining those peaceful relations. Do you have anything that you guys want to say about that? I full heartedly agree. Mm -hmm. Case. I just thought it was really great insight. Like it's, it's. I don't think any of us have seen it that way. I guess. So it was, it was. It's, it's, it's interesting that you say it. Especially coming from your perspective as a general in the army, that's just something that we don't usually see that perspective. You know, just being high school students, mm -hmm. and a lot of us are going places. I know the ROT. C program is very popular here, and a lot of students are training and going into the military, but still we haven't reached that level yet. And to hear from someone so high up in the military saying that it's important to understand and respect other cultures, to understand where everyone is coming from, I think it's really important because that aligns with our missions and our values at IL Texas. And I think it's just you really solidifying the fact that we need to train to be leaders and being able to carry ourselves with our morals and our values and make sure that we're carrying ourselves with integrity. Very well put, McLean. Um, so actually, we have a very special event coming up. We are going to toss it over to some of our other campuses so they can ask questions. So our first question comes from the Lancaster DeSoto campus. So Lancaster DeSoto, please present your question. <laughs> Good morning, General Brown. Good morning. My name is Addison Beasley. I'm a freshman here at IL. Texas Lancaster DeSoto High School. Our question for you today is, what's a more important quality as a leader, charisma or humility? Uh, humility. Um, you know, partly as a leader, you gotta be able to look yourself in the mirror and uh, realize when you make a mistake 
and be transparent and the, be willing to tell the folks that you lead that you made a mistake. And because uh, if you don't, then they, they'll, they'll see right through you and you lose credibility as a leader. Absolutely. Right. General Brown, to ask a question on that, do you think that it's possible to change? Like if you've been going down a road where you haven't been humble as a leader, do you think it's possible to change your behavior and become an effective leader going onward? Uh, to a point. <laughs> I mean, you are who you are. And uh, I think in some aspects, um, if you have a path when you're not humble, uh, you don't have humility, um, you, you, you got to build it into your character. And for some folks, it's not the, not how they uh, uh, either were brought up or the way they approach things. And it really starts at a young age. It starts in institutions like uh, schools like this, where you, you start to build that character and uh, it sets your path for your future. And, uh, and so you can uh, learn how to do some of these things, um, but it's, it's not as simple as it may seem. What do you think the most damaging negative trait a leader could have would be? Something to avoid, if you will. Um, being self-indulged, mm. which is more about them than it is about the people, organization they lead. And so uh, if you're in a position where it's all about you and you only worry about how you look, it's uh, really how the organization. Here's what I tell the people that you, you mentioned I have 46,000 airmen that uh, are, are part of PACAC. And what I tell them is they don't work for me. Uh, I work for them. Wow. My job is to make their job easier. And I have, the, I have the ability to do that because of the position I sit in where I can influence and make things much easier for everybody. Um, but if I can also make it easy for myself, but that's not what I'm about. It's really how do I actually support those, the airmen and their families. Um, and to me, that's important. That's, that's the thing that makes me, makes me happy. If I can break down a barrier someplace for somebody where there's a challenge and uh, I can change a policy across the Air Force that, that make it, makes it hard for uh, us to, to take care of airmen and their families or get the mission done. To me, that's, that's, that's what actually excites me about coming to work every day. We're grateful for your answer, General. Thanks. Now, let's kick it on over to Windmill Lakes Orem High School for their question. Windmill Lakes Orem, are you there? Yes, good morning. Good morning, General Brown. Yeah. Good morning, General Brown. My name is Marisol Zamora. I'm a sophomore in Windmill Lakes Orem High School. And our question for you is, you have been a leader through circumstances that can be perceived as dangerous and very difficult. How do you maintain your focus and how do you stay true to who you are in these circumstances? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? You have been a leader through circumstances that can be perceived and that can be perceived as dangerous and very difficult. How do you maintain your focus and stay true to who you are in times like these? Oh, um... This is a, when I talked about my uh, leadership tenet of being a uh, discipline execution, uh, even in the tough times, you actually got to kind of hold your, uh, your uh, character and your values. Um, and you have to make some tough calls. And, uh, and it's, you can always take the easy path. Um, and uh, I would like to say if, if leadership was easy, everybody would do it. And, and so sometimes you got to make those tough calls, even for yourself. And where you, you're, uh, you stay disciplined, you don't, take uh you don't take shortcuts um and uh when you do that that actually helps you to uh, uh maintain that level of uh of as, as a leader and not take a step backwards now we're gonna toss it down over to college station high school college station do you have your question yes we do um howdy general brown uh my Hi. name is my name is Jocelyn Timms, and I'm a freshman at the Isle Texas College Station High School. We have a question for you today. Our question is that our school emphasizes servant leadership. What in your background taught you the importance of helping others in order to be a successful leader? Um, you know, I, I'd probably uh, I, I owe a lot of that to my parents, uh, my grandparents. Um, we went to church every Sunday, went to Sunday school. Um, but it's really uh, the model they set for me on, on how do you actually help help others. And it goes back to something I said a little bit earlier. It's, it's really not about me. It's really about uh, how I help other people 
And the, uh, I think the real joy of being able to lead a organization or a team is the success of the team, not the success of me as an individual, but how we together um, do things. And that actually drives you to be more of a servant leader when you're, you're really pushing to make your team better, not just yourself. And uh, it goes back to what I also said, if you have a team, everybody's got different skill sets. Um, you know, I like to think about the Avengers. You know, if they all had the same superpowers, they wouldn't be a great team. And so we all have various different superpowers and how do you take advantage of those superpowers uh, that you have and the superpowers of your teammates and how you bring the, the, all those together as a servant leader and amplify the skill sets and the superpowers of all those that you have a chance to, to be around. General, go ahead. I defer. No, you can go. Okay. General, you said you had kids. So, as a father, how do you instill the leadership qualities that you possess into your children? How do you try and do that? Be a role model. Okay. This is the uh, discipline execution. So, if I tell my boys, don't walk across the grass, use the sidewalk, they better not catch me walking across the grass. Mm -hmm. Okay. When that's a hard, I mean, that's one of those things you, you can take the shortcut, but it's, a, it's the models that you present to them. So they see that every day in, in you. Because um, you don't want to have a, uh, as we say, a say-do gap. I say one thing, but I do another. Um, and it's important to be, uh, uh, so you got to hold yourself to, to those high goals of, and standards that you set for your, uh, my son. So I got to do the same thing for myself. I like that. Look like? No, I was just going to say it's really interesting because a big part of leadership that people don't realize is delegating. You have to know not only your strengths, but everyone else's strengths under you. And I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that, that your job is to make their job easier. You're going to put them in the position, a position where they can shine the most and they can be the most useful. And I think that is a very important quality of a leader is to be insightful about what other qualities their, um, whoever is under them has. And I just think that it's very interesting that you mentioned that earlier. Well, it's also a matter of trust. Mm -hmm. You mentioned delegation. And when you delegate, you got to trust people to do what you, you know, right. their job or the opportunity to present them. And there are probably may not always do it exactly the way you would do it, and they may not do it perfectly. Mm. But you got to give them trust and uh, allow them the opportunity because they'll grow. The folks that work with you will grow when you provide them those opportunities. Because I, I really don't have time to do all this stuff across our command. So I've got to actually, I do have to delegate and then trust them to do, to, to do their job. Do you do that with your children as well? Do you give them small tasks and responsibilities and hope that they move up and continue to grow? Well, yeah, my, my boys are 26 and 23. Oh. <laughs> so, when they were children then, yeah. Uh, yeah, I do, uh, to an extent. And I still give them tasks because they, uh, <laughs> I want to make sure you know, they're still a little bit on the payroll. Um, and the, the more I give them tasks to go do things, the less I have to show money out in their direction. <laughs> we're grateful for that response. Now we are going to kick it to my home campus of AGPHS, where we do things the best. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good morning, General Brown. Uh, my name is Kenneth Eze. I'm a junior at AGPHS. Our question is, what are three characteristics of an effective general? Uh, humble, approachable, and credible. Um, and that's something uh, when I was the uh, weapons school commandant, that was kind of our motto. And I think that's, uh, that applies to being a general girl. You gotta be humble. Where, uh, you know, I, I tell you, I've parked in any place I ever planned to be. Uh, it's gonna be four years and get out and I've overstayed my welcome by about 30 years. <laughs> And, and so, um, to me, that's one part. The other part is being approachable. And it, it's tough enough as a, as a four-star general that uh, sometimes folks, that people that work for you don't wanna come talk to you because they're intimidated. Uh, but I tell them, I'm just like they am, I'm just older. I've just been around a little bit longer. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're approachable because that way you get information so you can actually help make decisions versus being very isolated. Right. But you also need to be credible. And so, uh, you, know, you, you get the background, you know, all, all my flying and all the things I've done builds that credibility. So when we do make a decision and I stand behind it, um, folks can look at it and go, yep, they, they can believe in the things that we do. So if those are the kind of the three characteristics I would, I would offer. So how do you become more approachable, especially when you're in a position of such immense power? 
Um, you, you, there's a couple things I do. Um, for example, um, I do launches periodically with different parts of my staff. Because there's folks that don't get, there's people that see me every day, but there's other people that don't get a chance to see me. So I make an effort to, to go out and, uh, and see them. And so when I do those lunches or different events versus people coming to my office, I will go to give them home court advantage by going to where they are. Um, the other thing I do is, um, you know, a lot of times you'll, you know, when I have the conference room table, uh, you can sit at the head of the table. I don't. I sit at the side of the table so it's kind of a round table. Wow. And it's less intimidating and, and it's more of a dialogue. Um, and I like the dialogue because to me it's, it's a way of being able to, I get to learn something just like they get to learn something as well. And it seems like when you mentioned the Avengers earlier, instead of it being there's you and then everyone else who's beneath you, it seems like you guys really work together as a team and you know their strengths and you want to get that dialogue going to get their input as well. And I think that's really a characteristic of a really good leader. Well, the other part I look at too is that uh, I try to be part of the process. I like to iterate things. I like to be, you know, I like to get my hands dirty, so to speak, with the folks that are working on things. Because if I get it at the very end and they think it's perfect, I find that their perfect and my perfect are not always in the same ballpark. Right. So the way to do that is actually working on it together because then we own it together. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that's important. So we, we are all a part of the team. And uh, I think we all uh, bring value to the things that we do. Um, and so that's why I enjoy working with our the staff. And we go back and forth to bring, uh, so we get a you know, better product in the long run. General, if I may, how do you maintain the balance between being approachable while still be seen as an authority figure? Hmm, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, well, this <laughs> provides a little bit of the authority figure. <laughs> it kind of comes with the territory, and it's just, just the way the military is. So you already get authority just based by virtue of your rank. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the actions you take and, and how you engage with, with, uh, with people. Matter of fact, we just uh, finished up my commander's conference. So we had all my commanders from across the Pacific, uh, their senior enlisted command chiefs and their spouses. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that we did for our conference is one, I could sit at the table and do all the talking, or I could actually, uh, or show a bunch of PowerPoint slides and put people to sleep, <laughs> or I could actually engage. And that's what we did. And so what I really do is try to pull out from folks by being able to allow them to speak and provide their inputs. And then we, the other part is, is you actually not only listen to them, but you actually take it and take action on it. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Interesting insight, General. So our next cut, our next question comes from my home campus, also the best campus. I know we're at Garland, but whatever. Katie West Park <laughs> High School, please let us hear your question. <laughs> Katie. Hello. Good morning, General Brown. Is so nice to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Maria Tran. I am currently a sophomore at Isle, Texas, Katie West Park. My question for you today is, how much do you personally interact with the Air Chiefs of our allies in the Pacific, like Japan, Australia, and India? And how high is the level of cooperation? Um, actually quite a bit uh, with the Air Chiefs. And uh, so there's about 20, 20 Air Chiefs within the Indo-Pacific. I've met with 17 of them in the past 14 months, and some of them uh, multiple times. And so, um, you know, when I go, I go to these international air shows, uh, I really don't go to the air show. I, I go to speed dates with air chiefs. Uh, that's the way I describe it, because what I'll do is I'll spend half an hour blocks, 45 minute blocks, where I just sit down with them and we talk about uh, different things of interest um, uh, that we have across the region. And then the other thing I do is I actually call them periodically. Uh, so just uh, a couple nights ago, I talked to the, uh, the Air Chief from the Royal Thai Air Force. Uh, he, he retires on Monday. And so uh, we've had a chance to meet a couple of times and just call to tell him good luck and congratulations as he uh, makes the transition. And so uh, um, probably our strongest partners in the region are Australia and Japan uh, and Korea. Uh, I go to Korea here in about two weeks. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, I'm usually, you know, I, 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 I really don't live in Hawaii. I just store my clothes there and that's where my mail goes. Uh, right. I spend about half my time not in Hawaii. 
and is really going out to visit with the various Arab chiefs because it's important. It's not just me meeting with the Arab chiefs, but it's other parts of my staff meeting with their counterparts um, and the exercises we do across the region and how we roll those, those partnerships with the, the uh, different countries in the region. So do you think that understanding the different cultures of Japan and Korea and you know our other allies, it, and also maybe even understanding a little bit of the languages and the nuances help you make those friendships stronger? It, it does. It's not only the culture, but it's also a little bit of the history. Ah, yes. Um, to understand the dynamics of why uh, different countries see different things a different way. And I'll also tell you the thing that I find too is that the how over time um, those relationships change. You know, I'll give you a good, a good example. So here about a year ago, I had the Japanese Air Chief visit our headquarters. And our headquarters is uh, at, at Hickam uh, Air Base. Mm -hmm. It was a dormitory on December 7th, 1941. And the, you can go to our headquarters right now. You can still see the bullet marks from when the Japanese strafed our headquarters. And so as the Japanese Air Chief is going through and we're, we're showing him this, he, uh, he says, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and we have a really good relationship and times have changed. Uh, here about a month ago, I was in Vietnam and uh, same kind of dynamic, uh, 25 years, uh, almost 25 years of normalized relations with Vietnam. And it was a really good, really good visit. And so what you see over time is understanding the history, but then building those relationships is important to how you, how we grow as a nation. And the more you understand and really how you listen, is we could do as the United States, we could do a lot of talking. It's, it's how we listen to what our partners have to say is what makes us uh, makes it really valuable. Wow, and I am so appreciative of that response. But I also want to toss it over to my campus, and I'm not going to say it's the best campus because that caused a riot last time. But I want to give it over to Stellar Keller Saginaw High School. Genesis, take it away. <laughs> Good morning, General. My name is Genesis Grant, and I represent Keller Saginaw High School. First and foremost, our student body would like to thank you for your service and sacrifice to our country. Our question is, how has being connected internationally affected all aspects of your life? Um, it's, it's been an education, and I'll go back to when I was in high school. So our, I spent seventh through ninth grade living in Germany, uh, my dad's retired army. And one of the things he shared with me was, uh, uh, this is a quote, you will get a chance to see th things that most kids only get a chance to read about. And that's true. And, and I, I would say that still applies even today. Uh, I pinched myself in a little place that I've had a chance to go and visit and see. Uh, we went, you know, like in December, my wife and I went to the Taj Mahal, which is, which is pretty cool. And I've been to the South Pole. Um, and so all those different opportunities help me to have a different perspective about the world and see uh, and understand a little bit more of the dynamics of what kind of what goes on internationally. Um, and I, one of the things I end up doing a lot of is uh, I go to embassies. I go to U.S. embassies all around the world and sit down with the ambassador and get a chance to understand uh, the things that they're working through and how I can help them um, a, as I go to visit. Do you have anything to add, Ingo? Um, I just find that really interesting. So, like, with everyone, like, you communicate, do you ever find a situation where, like, people can cause friction because of miscommunication? And if so, do you, how do you find a workaround for that? Um, that that's, uh, you know, your words really do matter. And that's the one thing I, I find and pay attention to is uh, what you say, how you say it. And if you don't understand the dynamics of the culture you're dealing with, uh, what you see may, may be misinterpreted. And so, you know, one of the areas I have to worry, worry about is that uh, periodically in uh, some of the countries, they don't speak English. And uh, unfortunately, I took three years of high school French and I don't use that very well. Mm. Um, and so what that is, how do you ensure that you're getting the right message across um, as you're talking to another air chief or senior leader from another country? Because they have a different perspective. And uh, how do you actually, and I'll also tell you as you walk away from some of those meetings, what you hear and what you think might have been said um, and the interpretation of that, uh, either literally or figuratively, of 
and you got to put it in, into context of other venues that have happened before you. That's why it's important for me when I go to, to different countries and I talk to the ambassador and the country team in that embassy, they have the, the more context than I might have. And so here's what, you know, an Arab chief said, here's what it meant because there's, there's more to the story that, you know, I'm only a part of the story. And so that, that's another key aspect of it. So, so do you find it advantageous for us because we are taking three languages for us to be learning these languages and to continue it as we head into college for our future careers? I think it is. I mean, it's not only the language, but it's it's all, also goes what goes with the language, the culture that goes with the history, um, and it, it'll give you opportunities to open some doors that you probably wouldn't have otherwise to make you think about uh, you know what goes on in the world. Uh, for example, my, my my wife's degree is in Spanish, and um, she's really good at languages, better than I am. Um, she speaks Spanish, does some Japanese. She's lived in Japan for a year while we were while we were dating. Um, she's taken Arabic, she's taken French, she's taken German, she's taken Italian, um, and she's got probably more culture than I have <laughs> because of all of those languages. She actually helps me in that regard. And so every time you take a language, you know, what I think is you open up a door, you pull the thread. You know, what I find is the more you figure out you know, you figure out there's more you don't know. And by taking these languages, I think it opens it opens it broad and makes you more curious. So you 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 start asking more questions and and you know start digging into the history, start digging into the culture, start digging into the, you know what type of food do they eat in certain places. I've eaten a lot of different things that uh, you know it's not a water burger, or brisket, or Dr Pepper, which are <laughs> three of my favorites, by the way. Speaking of different things, if I can change it to a little mm -hmm. of a lighter note, where is the most favorite place that you stayed at? Um, I would say that my one of my favorite assignments is living in Italy. Mm, beautiful. So we lived, um, uh, I was at Aviano Air Base as the wing commander, and our, our, um, our boys were high school, middle school. We lived about an hour, hour and 15 minutes north of Venice. Um, and so we, uh, and we got Italian food is, we don't eat at Garden anymore, let's put it that way. <laughs> Italian food, uh, fresh Italian food in Italy is, is just awesome. And, uh, and so that was probably one of our favorites because we got a chance to travel all around. And that was our first overseas assignment as a family because my previous overseas assignments were uh, into Korea by myself, uh, remotely. Right. Sir, if I may put a quick question in there, what is a mistake that you see leaders often commit and how can we avoid it? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Tayas. Um, maybe overconfidence. Mm -hmm. Goes back to humility. Yeah. If you get overconfident, you can uh, uh, and not be willing to listen. It's it's probably the other one. Is not be willing to listen because uh, you get inf you get information by listening. And uh, as a senior officer, if I walk into a meeting and I start talking about what I really think right from the start, then I can shut down everybody else. Because what they'll do is then they'll go, well, that's obviously what General Brown wants to hear. And so what they'll say is they'll all agree with me, but they'd be completely wrong. So it's more important that I sit back and, and listen to what people have to say. And then once I take all the information, then I can now say, here's what I think. So Even for our most junior people that are that are talking as well. Um, go ahead. Sorry. So I was going to say, so that would go hand in hand with uh, having good communication with your team. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's communication, whether it's uh, in person. Uh, and of course, I do a lot of email because I'm traveling so much. Mm -hmm. But I like personally, I, I prefer the face to face. You know, if I can go face to face, if I can do the VTC like we're doing here, a video teleconference uh, system like we're doing with the, the uh, other campuses, or uh, a telephone call. It's, it's much easier. That way I can get some feedback. Because you, you can see body language, you can see facial expressions that you can't get in an email. Yeah, right. So, um, you're not getting the input? I mean, to be honest, like, with this generation nowadays, all they have is their phones, so and it's kind of distracting. So I'd agree. Yeah, so <laughs> they need to be able to learn how to communicate properly. And I think that was very insightful to be able to help them do that. Yeah. So when I came in the Air Force, uh, we didn't even have email. You know, much, much less a uh, you know a uh, smartphone <laughs> uh, or a cell phone. So you actually had to talk to people, and that's uh, I think an area that is important. And by learning a language, 
the language that you're learning here at the uh, International uh, Leadership uh, School it gives you an opportunity to broaden that horizon and your communication skills. So would you believe it ad advantageous to those, to those students who do not have a phone? I don't want to say it's advantageous. You don't have a phone, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would say it's probably good sometimes to put your phone down. You know, and uh, put your phone down and actually have a conversation. Too often I see folks all go to dinner at the same table and everybody's on their phones texting and emailing them. So why do you go to dinner together? Um, I've noticed that you've actually published something before, correct? Mm -hmm. And is there one thing, you know, you have a platform right now, is there one little tidbit that you would like to share with all of us today? Oh, I've written a few things, but um, that was a uh, year at, uh, I was working with a think tank mm. um, when I was a lieutenant colonel. So I had a, a full year to actually to think and, and write the, a book that got published. Um, it takes time. Um, but what I do uh, personally is I, one benefit of having a phone is when I read things, I can cut and paste and I have a keep notes on my phone that I can go back and refer to in the future. Um, so when I do get a chance to write, um, I'm, I use that as an opportunity to, to pull my thoughts together. So General, while we were doing a bit of quick research on you, we uh, saw that you have a book. Uh, how could, if we were to read this book, what is something that you would want us to pull from it? And also, do you plan to release anything in the future? Well, you'd have to actually be interested in the military. Because <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's about our doctrine. It's about how, how we operate in a, uh, in a uh, wartime environment. Mm -hmm. And it's how we, it really talks about how we communicate. And so if there's anything that I would probably take from it, it's really how do you communicate with the difference. Each of our services have, has a little bit different culture and how we operate. We have different capabilities. And when you work in a joint environment, uh, it's very easy for us to get very parochial and you're only worried about the way you do things. Yours is better than everybody else's. Um, the one part about joint warfare is how do you work together to take the best of each of the services and bring them together to be effective in how we communicate. And unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. But I want to thank you again so much, General Brown, for being here and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Can we all please thank General Brown? On behalf of IL Texas, I would like to bestow you with this gift. This is on behalf of all of the students here. If you want to open it now, you can, or you can wait until later. It's up I'll to you. It. And I also want to thank again, Garland, your band was absolutely phenomenal. And I also yeah. want to thank Garland again for hosting this event. Good job, Garland. <laughs> I'd like to say I speak on on behalf of all the campuses and all our student body present here, we say we're very honored and we're very humbled to be able to have this opportunity and learn from you this morning. Well, thank, thank you for the invite. It's uh, been a real pleasure. And hopefully something I share with you today will be useful to you as you, uh, no matter where you are in your, in your uh, high school and then really throughout life. And I want to wish all of you uh, the very best of luck. Of course, too. Judging from the smiling faces in the audience and up here too, I believe we all had a ton of fun this time. And I would like to remind all of us to stay tuned for the third speaker series in our leadership speaker series and stay tuned because it's coming soon. I would just like to thank you so much for this experience. I have, I'm pretty sure all of us have learned a lot from you coming here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a Clayton Marshall representing the Keller, so, <laughs> Keller Saginaw High School campus. I'm Teresa Scudero representing the Katie West Park campus. I'm Tasia Foster, representing Arlington Grand Prairie High School. I'm Enoch Adoye, representing Garland High School.